This is the gospel according to John, the 21st chapter, beginning with the first verse. After these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples by the sea of Tiberias, and he showed himself in this way. Gathered there together were Simon Peter, Thomas, called the twin, Nathaniel of Cana and Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two others of his disciples. Simon Peter said to him, I am going fishing. They said to him, we will go with you. They went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Just after daybreak, Jesus stood on the beach, but the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. And Jesus said to them, children, you have no fish, have you? They answered him, no. He said to them, cast the net to the right side of the boat and you will find some. So they cast it. And now they were not able to haul it in because there were so many fish. The disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, It is the Lord. When Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on some clothes, for he was naked and jumped into the sea. But the other disciples came in the boat, dragging the net full of fish, for they were not far from the land, only about a hundred yards off. When they had gone ashore, they saw a charcoal fire there with fish on it and bread. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish that you have just caught. So Simon Peter went aboard and hauled the net ashore full of fish, 153 of them. And though there were so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. Now none of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? Because they knew it was the Lord. Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them and did the same with the fish. This was now the third time that Jesus appeared to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. When they had finished breakfast, Simon said, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my lambs. A second time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, tend my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter felt hurt because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Very truly, I tell you, when you were younger, you used to fashion your own belt and to go wherever you wished. But when you grow old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will fasten a belt around you and take you where you do not wish to go. He said this to indicate the kind of death by which he would glorify God. After this, he said to him, follow me. This is the gospel of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Brothers and sisters, grace to and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus the Christ. Amen. It's a great story, isn't it? I love it. There's a bit here to think about, but a couple of things stood out. If you don't have a study Bible, one with notes in the margins, liner notes, I like to call them for those of you that remember records. Remember liner notes? They were fun. Anyway, if you don't have a study Bible with those notes in the margins, you should get one. Sometimes the editors come up with thoughts that stretch our imaginations. Sometimes they come up with thoughts that create a little bit of an aha moment. I have a few of those notes as well as my own written in the margins. Yes, you should write in your Bible. Mark it up with thoughts at the time because when you go back a little later on, you're looking at going, what was I thinking? Right? It happens. But this is the the study Bible which I use to teach the youth in confirmation. So let's walk through some of those thoughts and see if they come to you as well. There's two main things happening in this story, two little short stories that make it up. The disciples are fishing, and then they come ashore to eat what we assume and what is written in the text. They eat what they caught. It says in the text that Jesus is there, but there's some confusion as to whether or not they recognize him. And this text is at the end of John's gospel, and we can infer, because it's written there, that this is post-resurrection. It's really the only post-resurrection appearance that John outlines after they have the conversations as they were locked in the room. Other gospel accounts have more post-resurrection appearances that are outlined, but John uses this one 
to make a point, so let's see if we can figure that out, right? So the first part is about fishing. And it's not only about fishing, it's about hauling in a huge catch. The catch is so big, as a matter of fact, they can't even handle it. Right? They can't get it into the boat. This points us towards the abundance that comes into our lives when we listen to Jesus. These guys are out fishing and catching nothing. And notice here that they have essentially returned to their former jobs. Now this is an idea that actually crept into my own head during Holy Week. Remember that journey from Palm Sunday to Monday, Thursday, Good Friday, Easter Vigil, and then Sunday. Imagine keeping in mind the events of that week that these guys had dropped everything to follow Jesus and then their leader dies. They would have been a bit shaken up and probably would have wondered if they could get their old jobs back, right? I mean, Jesus had come along. I do feel a little sorry for Zebedee and his family, right? James and John, the sons of Zebedee, were out fishing. Jesus comes along and says, drop your nets, follow me, I'll make you fishermen. And they just go, okay. And they drop their nets and walk away, and Zebedee's standing there in the family business going, boys, boys, but, huh. Suddenly he's left with no staff, right? I mean, it's a weird way to think of it, but it works. But these guys had committed to Jesus, left what they were doing in order to make a living, to go to this new thing that Jesus invited them into, and then in a blink of an eye, overnight, as it were, their boss, their leader, the creator of their business, dies. Can you imagine the conversation with these guys? Great, now what are we supposed to do? I wonder if dad will take us back. And then they would have had to have a pretty tough conversation with dad for sure, right? They go walking back because they had walked away in a blink of a mo- in a, just a moment and now they had to kind of come crawling back and do some fast talking to get back into the family business as, as they were fishing in this particular text. One could assume they got their jobs back, so it's all good. So here they are fishing and doing poorly. No fish in the net. And then Jesus shows up. They don't know it's him, but they listen And when they do, they catch not just fish, but an overabundance of fish, right? And then they sit down to eat what they catch. Details of the meal, the breaking of the bread, again, point us toward the Eucharist. And the bread and fish point us toward the feeding of the masses. I think this is intentional as we are reminded of the care of Jesus in abundance, even in the face of our own disbelief. But that's how Jesus is, right? Then we move into the second part of the story. We get a glimpse into the conversation that follows the meal. Again, we get a substantial view of the back and forth between Jesus and Peter. And again, there's a point, right? There's a connection to be made. In short, Jesus asks Peter three times if Peter loves him. And three times, Peter says yes. Anyone else reminded of that trial and beating where Peter denied Jesus three times? I'm telling you, those liner notes are pretty good. This is Jesus forgiving Peter for that. Not only does Jesus forgive Peter, but he sends Peter forward into a life with a renewed purpose, a new career, so to speak. We know from the disciples' travels in Acts that this is just what Peter does, right? The other thing that comes in the notes is the prediction of Peter's death that's outlined here. Peter was crucified as well. And Jesus says as much when he says Peter will stretch out his hands. This is all kind of interesting stuff. It's great trivia. It's great connection. But what does it have to do with us today in this life. Incidentally, you know what the most fun little fact that stood out in this text for me? Why were these guys fishing without any clothes on? (laughs) I'm not going to go there. I just every time I read it, I go, what? And why write that in there? It's like, John, really? TMI, pal. Too much information. I don't need to know that. Okay, so let's see if we can connect this to life, right? Let's talk about fish first. Jesus is always with us and always leading us into abundance. We see that and experience that when we see Jesus. I'm not just talking about seeing with our eyes. We, we see that fish. We see 153 fish. We know that we can see the presence of Jesus when we open our eyes to it. We get that. 
What about seeing Jesus with our hearts? Probably not as easy. It's easy to see Jesus with our hearts and trust that Jesus is always with us, leading us in abundance, isn't it? I mean, isn't that easy? Probably not. I think that's harder than seeing with your eyes, is seeing with your heart. We humans have hard hearts. The world makes them that way. Our experiences make our hearts hard. What we think we know about how the world unfolds can certainly harden our hearts. And when that happens, it can be difficult to see Jesus. I bet we can all think of examples of that. Can you think of a time where you encountered a situation your heart told you that it was not going to work out all that well? It's easier and kind of more comforting to run to a place of security in the face of something new and not let Jesus lead you into, a, into the abundance and into that situation with a vision toward that abundance. I think sometimes of how that played into the disciples in fishing. They were faced with a new career path with Jesus, weren't they? And they ran instead to a career that they knew. Even that didn't work out real well until Jesus showed up. Can you relate? Then after the fish thing, they sit and they have a conversation about the future. And we don't hear much about the interactions between Peter and Jesus after Peter denied him. One would imagine that after Jesus rose and appeared to them in that room that they were locked in for fear of the people around them, right? Jesus shows up post-resurrection. You can imagine Peter kind of staring at his feet going, oh man, I messed that up. After all, Peter promised he would follow Jesus and be committed to the path right till the end. And then he didn't. Can you relate? Have you ever made a promise to Jesus that didn't work out like you thought it would? I'd be willing to bet that the answer to that question would be probably yes for most of us. The thing is that Jesus comes and talks with Peter and wipes that slate clean and starts over. Jesus redirects us, even if it takes three times, into the life that he has planned for us, and even we can't get in the way of that, right? Jesus, three times, embraces the love that Peter has for him and tells him to take that love and do something with it. Jesus gives Peter purpose. Feed my lambs, tend my sheep, feed my sheep follows the progress of life, right? As we grow, we grow from needing tending as little lambs to needing food as old sheep. That's part of the story. Jesus tells Peter that loving him is all well and good. I get that. Yep, you say you love me. Now go do something with it. So should we all. I'm in the midst of my one-on-one -on -one conversations with the confirmation students. There's one requirement. They have to meet with me. Does that sound scary? It's not. Okay, they got to sit down and meet with me. And we have a talk about faith, where they are with faith, and how we did as a community of faith getting them there. They'll claim those baptismal promises and promise to live into them this fall. I have to do it now because I'll be on sabbatical all summer long. But these conversations about faith are really what this text is all about. Do they love Jesus? If so, and I submit their answers are pretty much all a resounding yes. But what are they going to do with it? Claiming those promises is fine. What are you going to do with it? We all have a unique and individual love for Jesus. Jesus knows that. We bring the life that he has given us into that love, and Jesus uses that as a basis for how we as individuals will feed his sheep. The answers these eighth graders give are awe-inspiring and humbling. It's amazing to think of how they will feed Jesus' sheep as they walk through their own lives of faith. I know that we all have a part to play in their faith formation because all y'all promised that at their baptism. When we said, do you promise to support and care for these people? And you all go, yep, well, there it is. But it's Jesus who creates the abundance with, with which they see the world and their place in it. And I give thanks for all of them. I give thanks for all of you and the abundance that flows through all of us. Amen.